I would like to uh, start out today by honoring and acknowledging that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. I'm joining you today from Fort Francis, Ontario, which is situated in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and the Métis people, where it is my great privilege to live, work, and learn. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places, and this is one of the things that makes the online environment special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. So hello everyone and uh, welcome to eCampus Ontario's adaptive uh, learning webinar using AI to build retention for learning. My name is Don Eldridge and I'm a digital learning associate here on the programs and services team at eCampus Ontario, where I work primarily on our adaptive learning portfolio. Gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce our main presenters. So joining us uh, for, today from Georgian College is uh, Linda Thomason, college-wide coordinator for communications courses and liberal arts. Linda has been teaching in the Ontario College system since 1999 and joined Georgian College in 2003. Throughout her teaching career, Linda has taught multiple courses in English for academic purposes and communications, where she loves to explore strategies to engage learners and improve student success. Linda believes that learning happens when students feel supported and have options and choices about how and what they're learning. James Fielding has worked in post-secondary education for over 13 years in faculty, support staff, and administrative roles, and currently holds the position of campus manager for Georgian's Muskoka campus. Apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship form the core of Muskoka's campus programming, where James's unique perspectives help equity-deserving groups overcome barriers when choosing non-traditional career paths. James's research interests include the intersection of ethics and student course evaluations, as well as how students, faculty, and administrators can work together to improve the student's experience and learning outcomes through technology. Also from uh, Georgian College is Isabelle Deschamps, uh, who has been a faculty member with Georgian College since 2017. Prior to joining the college, she completed her postdoctoral fellowship in speech and hearing, hearing neuroscience laboratory at Servo Brain and Research Center in Quebec City. She received her PhD from McGill University in 2013 from the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders and holds a graduate diploma specializing in mental health. Her multidisciplinary background provides her a new, unique expertise to teach in a variety of programs and support research in, initiatives at the college. For the past two years, Isabel has served as principal investigator on a Future Skills Center funded grant that explores how Georgian College can mo modernize its programs and support faculty, staff, and students in acquiring new technological skills to keep up with ever changing digital demands. And Mark Ina. Uh, Dean of the Center for Teaching and Learning, a former full-time liberal, liberal arts and science professor, uh, pro program coordinator, director, and associate dean. Mark has 20 years experience in higher education, specifically in the college sector. In his current role, he oversees, with the help of a tremendous team, resources, opportunities, and support related to faculty development and professional learning. This includes supporting all the faculty when it comes to learning and educational technologies, the college's learning management system, the development and review of CTL pathways, which focus on building out courses in multiple modalities, full-time and part-time faculty professional development opportunities, and VR AR projects. The goal of the Georgian College CTL is to inspire excellence by igniting curiosity, connecting communities, and supporting bravery at the leading edge of teaching and learning, and Mark is extremely pleased to lead and be part of that vision. And representing today's featured technology is Brian Gore with Memray.ai, where his responsibilities include sales and business development for higher education and training. Brian brings to Memray extensive experience in the publishing sector, having worked with leading companies in the industry. 
Ryan also worked for 20 years as a guitarist, founding the Global Tour International Guitar Night. Uh, Brian holds a bachelor's degree in language studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. He also studied philosophy, literature, and German at Universität Tübingen in Germany. And I'm sure I butchered that, so I do apologize <laughs> if that's the case. Uh, welcome uh, all, and thank you very much for uh, bringing your insights here today. Uh, before I turn it over uh, to you folks for a great presentation, I just want to provide a little bit of context to eCampus Ontario's work in adaptive learning. So uh, adaptive learning platforms are educational technologies that assess a learner's knowledge, identify skills gaps, and provide a personalized instructional path towards learning outcomes. Overlapping with adaptive learning are other technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and intelligent tutoring systems. Often experiential in nature, these technologies are grounded in competency-based instruction and move the learner towards mastery through ongoing practice and immediate feedback. Among the many benefits of adaptive learning, these technologies have been shown to improve learning efficiency, knowledge transfer, and learner engagement. eCampus has been working in the adaptive learning space for the past several years, where we see these technologies as an important and emerging part of the digital transformation of higher education. You can see details about our work by visiting our adaptive learning webpage at the link now being posted in the chat. For the remainder of today's webinar, we'll be hearing from Georgian College and Memre, who will discuss the use of the Sergo memory engine that leverages cognitive science and artificial intelligence to help learners build memory and turn knowing into doing. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and hand things over to our presenters to uh, take it away. Over to you. Uh, wow, great. Thank you, uh, Don. I really appreciate it. Uh, just give me one second while I share my screen and we'll get going. And if I can just get a, a, an audio thumbs up that it's working, that'd be great. And you're good to go. Good, thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, uh, thank you very much to eCampus Ontario and Don and the whole team for inviting us uh, and providing us this with, with this opportunity. Um, today, um, we are going to talk to you uh, and with you about adaptive learning using AI to build retention for learning. And um, as Don mentioned and gave you some bios, uh, this project is not possible without a tremendous uh, commitment and enthusiasm of the individuals listed on the opening slide. And, and the individuals that will be speaking with you today. And uh, you know, a big thank you to this group for, for making this happen. So here are some high level uh, outcomes for our presentation today. Give you a quick little overview of the project, um, why we, how we got here uh, and how we chose our, our vendor and our platform. Uh, and then Brian will give you some, some great oversight in terms of the product itself and what it, it does and what it can do. We'll then move over to the uh, COM 1016 experience, the course that we chose to use for this platform and this project. We will then uh, do a little bit of a dive on the research that we've done and then talk about next steps and then um, handle any questions uh, if there are any. So project overview. Um, the first piece here is really finding the right Fit. And what I mean by that is um, we didn't want to just uh, select uh, a product and force it. We really wanted it to be the right fit for our college. Um, and that happens in a couple of ways. So first of all, a, a kudos goes to the academic leadership team and the senior leadership team at Georgian College, where, the, where that group saw a real commitment or provided a real commitment uh, to this project. So you need that leadership and we appreciate that leadership and, and the support provided by that group. Um, we are also very thankful to have a, a, dig a digital innovation uh, pot of monies um, that were allocated to this project. Um, and so that leadership commitment and funding commitment were really essential and really in enthused us and sparked our imagination and creativity when it came to um, launching this initiative. Uh, with that in place, uh, it was a matter of selecting a program. Uh, we, we looked around, we explored multiple programs, we had conversations with a number of uh, community members at Georgian, uh, trying to land on the right program. But we also wanted to pick a program that would challenge the platform and challenge us. 
So it was a very open process. We came into this project uh, with a blank slate. We really did not decide up front that this program will need this uh, platform or any of that sort of um, those sort of parameters. We really came into this fresh. And after a lot of uh, many conversations, uh, we landed on the comms 1016. And comms 1016 is the um, is, is the course that all diploma students uh, are, are fed through, or it's a, it's a standard course that uh, students have to take at the college level. And um, the reason why we landed on this program is that we had faculty that were excited and curious about the platform. Uh, we're also dealing with a course where student retention uh, can be problematic. It's one of those courses where students might have to take it a couple of times. It's one of those courses where it does take a high degree of uh, engagement with your students in order for them to be successful. So we saw this as a, as a good program, as a good course, because it has a really provided us with some really unique challenges. And there were some clear student needs. Students were struggling in key areas in the course. And so an opportunity to select a platform that would allow them to work and rework through some of that content to ensure that they can be successful. So with the program selected, it was a matter of finding, uh, oops, there we go. Yeah, that was gonna happen. Uh, with the program selected, it was a matter of finding the right uh, platform. And so we were really looking for a partner. Uh, we were really looking for a vendor that would understand our needs and would understand what, we, uh, what our expectations were and what we were hoping to get out of the platform. And so we did go the formal route. We went through an RFQ process uh, and in that RFQ, we focused on a couple of key areas. We wanted an open platform, a platform that allowed us to take control of the content, allowed us to be creative, allowed us to upload content that we needed and thought that was necessary. Uh, we didn't want the platform to be publisher bound. In other words, we didn't want to be tied to a textbook. We wanted a platform that we could apply to multiple courses and or multiple programs. And there were certain adaptive features that we needed. We needed some metrics, some dashboards, we needed uh, a high degree of, uh, of branching. We needed that machine learning uh, piece. And, um, and we really needed a platform that we could play around with for a number of semesters. Uh, we didn't want to simply select a platform, try out for four months, and then say this is it or not it. So we needed a vendor that would work with us uh, so that we could have a proof of concept and uh, with the option or ability to upscale when necessary. So our approach was really a uh, community approach. We wanted to involve as many community uh, members uh, at Georgian College as possible. Uh, we engage with uh, liberal arts and obviously uh, Linda Thomason is here today to speak to that uh, on that front. Uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning plays a key part in this project, institutional research, uh, IT and the Digital Innovation Fund. And we also wanted to get uh, other partners involved, including James Fielding, who works at uh, one of our main campuses, uh, an instructional designer and other faculty involved. Uh, we went out, we did hire an instructional designer. Um, I think we believed it was important to have a project manager slash instructional designer at the, uh, at the uh, it mixed into this project. We needed their guidance. Uh, we, we hired um, full-time and uh, non-full-time faculty. We felt that there was a real need to have a good mix of faculty from the comms program. And we laid this out over a year. So we really were generous. Uh, and I think that's necessary when taking on a project of this kind. So we spent one semester, the summer semester of 2022, uh, building out the content, uh, spending time identifying which modules needed to be built out, who would do which work, how long that work would take. So we really took three, four semesters, uh, sorry, three or four months building that content out with the intention of launching uh, the pilot in the fall of, of 2022. And then uh, we are currently in our second semester of the pilot winter 2023. And then uh, risk and the risk mitigation piece was really important. And uh, what I stated to the team and to the college was, we don't know if this will work. And I think you have to go in with a bit of that attitude. There is a bit of a, an, an uneasiness or a, a not really, we're not really certain if this, if the students are going to like the product, if they're going to use the product, if they're going to benefit from the product. So we really went into this with a pilot mentality. Um, at the, in the end, uh, we, we 
cur encourage 10 to 15 faculty to engage with, with, the, um, with the project, with the platform. We um, acquired 700 student licenses. So we have a good group of students involved. Uh, and we've uh, added a, a SOTL research component at the end as well, or an ongoing SOTL research component to ensure that what we're doing makes sense, makes sense for the faculty, makes sense for the students and makes sense for the college. And out of this, we're gonna find out if, uh, you know, what the next steps look like. And we'll, we'll get to that later in the presentation. So that's how we got here. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Brian to talk about um, the vendor, uh, the product that we selected and We'll go from there. Brian, you're up. Awesome. So uh, I want to start out um, my end of the discussion with a little bad news. Um, you're all going to forget what we talked about today. That's just a fact of life. Um, it's the forgetting curve. We're set up to forget. Um, but the good news is um, if I sent you a follow-up assignment, about the content of this presentation, and you did just four short reviews, we'd reverse your forgetting curve. And in the process, uh, we get a lot of uh, uh, insights into your levels of retention and readiness on the content as well. And I would hope that this uh, very simple and unique thing that we do with our AI that uh, no other platform does that I know, uh, basically helping you remember uh, is going to be something that you won't forget um, because it's going to it's going to be something that can have lasting benefits for for you and your institution and your students. Um, so why is it important uh, to to build retention? Well, uh, it can improve the student engagement and also their outcomes. Um, we've been able to show that you're able to very efficiently up to fifty percent more uh, improve the rate of learning for front loading of foundational information. And we've been able to show that our tool improves outcomes by 20% or more. Now in the process, you don't just get insights into learner retention levels, which is something you can't get in your learning management system, but you also get insights into learner readiness. And that's important when it comes to certifications or uh, exams or even employment placement, if that's something that your institution is involved with. But I think the most important thing is that it, it creates the opportunity for an institution to build real principles from cognitive science and principles of learning into the infrastructure of your, of your uh, learning culture. Uh, and that's just because we offer something that other systems don't, which is this distributed, effective distributed learning where you can't cram um, you're leveraging uh, the, the retrieval practice, you're testing little and often, uh, and you're also doing it, um, you know, over time in short bursts. So you're basically providing people with a form of learning that's aligned with principles from learning science. And you can get this all on your LMS. It doesn't matter which platform it is, uh, Blackboard, Canvas, or Brightspace, or Moodle. So the thing that makes me excited and made me super grateful about the team here is that they wanted to have an evidence-based approach. Um, we are an evidence-based company. Um, if, there's, if there's input that we get from the study that's being conducted on this, it's gonna benefit us, whether it's good or bad input. Um, what we have been able to show is that with you know, the US Air Force and US Army basic training, they were able to get 23% better scores in 48% less time uh, in a six week program. New York University's dental school boosted their pass rate from 80 to almost 100% from, from using our tool. Uh, University of Hawaii Manoa used this as a supplement in lecture. The students got a better letter grade generally that were very engaged with the tool and did 16% better on analytic questions. And here's one that's just come out this is, this is why I wake up in the morning with a smile on my face. And um, you know, I think we're all wanting to achieve this goal for, for our learners and our, and our institutions. This three-year study at the, you know, at the Queensland University of Technology found that um, we were able to get the students' grades up by 20%. But I think 
Most importantly, what it showed was that the students were, that were struggling at the beginning, um, they were able to improve their predicted grade by 60% from, from using our tool. Uh, they were able to get to a comparable level of achievement to the students that weren't, weren't struggling at the beginning of the class. Now this is, we didn't commission this study. This was done independently. It's been peer reviewed and it's just been published. Uh, but I think it shows that we can be a force, a positive force for leveling the playing field um, in the institutions that we work with. Um, we do work with a lot of great uh, institutions, Queensland Department of Education, almost 700,000 students. Um, we work with also Cengage. Um, we work with Arizona State University, New York University. We're very, very proud of our budding relationship with Georgian College. And we hope that uh, we hope that more of you may consider joining the cohort as well. Um, I'm I'm not going to bore you with this the tedious details on this slide because I know you'll forget it anyways. Um, but uh, I hope to be able to you. Uh, I hope that you will refer to this uh, to what our capabilities are and our foundations um, uh, in the follow up material that comes with this. And who knows, maybe even the Cerigo assignment is to come as well. So just one final note, it doesn't really matter how you want to work with us. If you want to start with our platform uh, separate from the LMS, you can do that. We can integrate in your LMS. And also just food for thought, we're making our APIs available now as well. So any kind of proprietary platform that your institutions may be considering developing, uh, you can just plug our APIs into that and get this wonderful functionality going for you and your students the way you want it. That's about it from my end. I'm on mute. I've been also the, the designate uh, sharer of slides. So I'm going to, uh, do you see my next slide up there? Hold on one sec. And there you go, magic. Here's so I'm now going to pass it off to Linda and uh, Linda, I will do my best. Uh, just give me a nod or a wink or a thumbs up when you want me to move on to the next slide. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today. Um, so Mark, if you could just go to the next slide, please. So Communication Essentials, or COM 1016 is our course code at Georgian College, is an introductory level COM course that all students in diploma programs must take. It's also a prerequisite course, so um, students must take this course before they're able to move on to their second level communications course. And like Mark mentioned earlier, we have some, you know, troubles with retention and some students, you know, not being successful with certain areas of the course. This course is heavily focused on writing skills. And of course, we do researching skills, citation styles, presentation skills, um, but the focus on writing skills is really the main area of the course. And, you know, grammar, punctuation, sentence structure skills are so important to improving students' uh, writing. Our 14 week semester, the curriculum is really full. So for us, um, for faculty of this course, we really feel sometimes like we don't have enough time in that 14 week semester to teach grammar, punctuation, and sentence structure skills in addition to all of that other content. So for us, this is kind of an area that we really wanted and we identified as a need to fill that gap. Um, next slide, please. So what did we want? We wanted an interactive online grammar guide, and I'm actually quoting faculty here from what they wanted. Um, that's something that faculty identified. Of course, we wanted something innovative and engaging, easy to use, mobile friendly, because we want students to use it. We want students to be excited about using this product. Um, Mark also mentioned this earlier, we really wanted control over building our content. Our faculty have decades of experience teaching these courses and these topics, so we really knew what we wanted um, to provide in terms of content. 
And the next point on the slide is that we wanted to be able to personalize the content for individual student experiences and skills. Not all students need to work on the same skills. Not all students need to work on improving their you know, use of commas. Some students might need to work on improving subject verb agreement, for example. So we wanted to be able to personalize that content for individual students. Of course, we need something that's able to be integrated into our learning management system. We use Blackboard, so we didn't want to have to have an extra step outside of Blackboard. And our goal for this project from the communications faculty is really we want a tool that's going to help improve students overall communication and writing skills by having students study these topics in the platform. Next slide, please, Mark. Okay, so what did we build? Um, we built 10 grammar modules, and inside these modules, they include pre-assessment questions to kind of gauge where the student is at the beginning of the study session. Um, the modules also include study pages, and these study pages are where we provide content. It could be in, ter um, in terms of a video that students will watch. It could be a short piece of text with a rule and an example. And then we have multiple choice questions throughout to check student comprehension. So if you look at the um, picture at the top of the slide, you can see one of the study pages where you have an, a rule for subject verb agreement. It consists of a short rule and a couple of examples. And the image at the bottom of the slide is what the students see in terms of their practice exercise. So they have um, a multiple choice question where they're identifying the correct um, response. In addition to the 10 grammar modules, we've also built three content related modules. So in this case, we took content that you know all faculty uh, work through in their course and developed them into modules as well. And then we've also created separate pre and post assessment tests um, to gauge you know, student improvement after completing these modules. So for the communications faculty, we're really excited about the potential for using a platform like this in our classes. And we see you know, a lot of great opportunities for faculty to develop some learning content that matches uh, their curriculum. OK, that's all for me. So I think we're going to pass it over to Isabel and James to talk about the research. All right, so thank you. And I think as Linda was saying, one of the great thing about this um, project is that it's a collaboration. So we have content experts and then we have um, other people that are supporting the research to um, assess and see um, what is um, the platform bringing to our students. Um, Mark, if you could go to the next slide, please. So when we um, jumped in from a research perspective into this um, project, um, we really thought about it um, from different angles. And one thing that we wanted to do was to have a um, research project that was um, quasi-experimental so that we can control as many variables and factors as possible so that our measurements um, or the variables that we decided to measure in the end to assess um, the effectiveness of Serigo um, or the grammar module was related to what students were learning. It would not do to um, external factor. So one of the things that we did is we um, did a literature review to kind of see what has been done in the past with regards to, um, instead of just measuring, for example, learning gains, as um, Linda was mentioning, so a pre and a post after doing the module, are there other metrics that we could leverage to see if the platform does um, indeed um, change the way students are engaging with content? And one of the things that we know from uh, research on education is that motivation is actually a very strong predictor of um, not only GPA, but as well as engagement and um, students' um, willingness or um, propensity to actually engage with the content. And we do know that grammar, um, although I, fi I find it fascinating as a second language learner, not um, all students share the same um, excitement uh, towards grammar modules. So if we could also target other than learning gains motivation, then maybe more students will actually engage 
um, with the module and the platform. So what we did is we approached um, this re like the research from two perspectives, one looking at learning gains, but also looking um, at motivation. Um, next slide, please, Mark. So doing research at the college and at the university in a course has its own um, challenges um, in the sense that um, in a perfect lab environment, uh, we can control many things. Um, at the college, um, we tried to control as many as we could. So one of the things, and this is with um, the amazing work that Linda has done helping us uh, with this factor, we were able to actually um, recruit faculty that were teaching at least two, two or four sections of COM 1016. So we could have um, a faculty that had an experimental um, section, meaning that they had the Serco platform embedded in their Blackboard um, shell or learning management system with the module. And they also had a section of um, what we call the, ex uh, the control condition, which is just um, the grammar module without the platform. Um, and this is amazing to be able to do that. Um, and we had also a variety of um, delivery methods. So we had online, we had flex and in-person um, delivery of COM 1016. Um, so once we had our, um, our partnership with the faculty, our next thing was um, to obtain um, ethics approval from our college to actually um, go into these courses. Um, and be able to recruit participants. And this is something to be aware of because one of the challenges in going into courses is that um, often one of the barrier is that um, there might be some um, students are there to learn. So we don't want the research project to take over um, the time that they're supposed to dedicate to their study. So that's something to keep in mind when you're actually designing a study for a course base is that the amount of time dedicated to research cannot be overwhelming. Um, because it might cause issues when you're uh, trying to get ethics approval at your institution. Um, next slide, Mark, please. So this looks a little bit complicated and overwhelming, but that's the diagram we actually submitted to our ethics board to explain the design of the study. Um, because it is a project that unfolds over time and requires um, a lot of efforts from um, faculty and um, support staff, we wanted to make sure that people understood the complexity of being able to deploy in, um, at the time we had um, five faculty, so 10 section um, of COM 1016, and we had seven modules when I applied for ethics, now we had 10. So um, you can see how amazing the work has been done by COM faculty to actually develop those modules, and it's amazing to do so in a short time span. So what the timeline actually demonstrate is that, um, in September, um, we had ethics board, we had approval, we had our flyer, uh, we use a QR code and a link to make it easier for students. So I actually went into COM 1016 classes and explained the study um, to students to make sure that they understood exactly what the research was about, but also to make sure um, that they understood as well that they could do um, participate in the modules without having to do the research, which is also very important. So we did the recruitment. And students that were interested in doing the study, all they had to do was to click on a link and it brought them to a consent form. Um, and then we had a brief social demographic questionnaire. We also had a motivation um, questionnaire and then the grammar pretest. So it's really important that before starting to do the modules, we had a baseline of where their grammar skills were. So that was deployed when we ran it the first time in September. And we actually opened up the recruitment for most of the semester to acknowledge that some students might not want to participate from the get-go, but then after maybe hearing from other students, they might want to actually participate. So that's how we got um, a bigger number of students participating is by having a recruitment period that was extended over time. Um, and then students um, had at their own pace could interact with the module and they got to select the modules they wanted to do first and which one they wanted to complete. And what happened is at the end of the semester um, on Blackboard, the post assessment actually um, became available. Students completed it. And then we actually sent them a short um, questionnaire at the end with um, a motivation questionnaire as well included, but also some open-ended question to get feedback on the modules and on the platform for the students that were in the experimental um, section. Next slide, please, Mark. 
So to give you an idea, the first time we deployed the study, this is actually the time um, that was required um, for students. So the sociodemographic questionnaire, which is research um, part is five minutes. The grammar pretest and post uh, were a bit longer because we, um, when they were developed by Compton 16 faculty, um, we wanted to make sure that we could capture the different modules, the 10 different modules, and we had enough items per module to really um, have a good um, idea of their baseline to see if there were changes. And they were a bit on the lengthy side, so 75 minutes. This is something that we improved for the second time around. And the motivation questionnaire that we use is based on the intrinsic motivation um, inventory by Ryan and Al, and it's very, very short as well. And what's fantastic about this questionnaire from a research perspective is you can modify it to accommodate for pre and the post, and as well as for the content of um, what you're trying to look at. So for instance, we could change the sentences to accommodate for a grammar module, but also for asking them how motivated they were prior to doing it, and whether doing the modules with the platform um, increased their motivation at the end. And then um, we had a few um, open-ended questions to get their feedback, because it's really important for us to know um, what they've learned and um, from the platform, or what are some of the things that might not be there that might meet their needs that they have. Next slide, please, Mark. James, over to you. Thanks, Isabel. So. Um... We had our fall pilot and we're currently uh, collecting our winter semester data. And the we're, our analysis is gonna be done this spring. So we're looking actually to uh, publish our results this coming fall, but I can share a little bit of the preliminary numbers from the fall pilot. So we had 508 students enrolled in our fall pilot and uh, 252 were in the control group and 256 were in the Cerigo, uh group. And of those 256 Cerigo users, we had complete user records for 51 participants. And then we had 11 uh, mixed method research participants that kind of followed all the way through the process. So it's still too early to tell uh, how the winter data collection will unfold, but uh, we did tweak a number of things that Isabel will just cover in a, just a minute, but I think we've done a, a, a good job there because to date we have more than double the number of completed user records uh, at 107, and we're just halfway through the winter semester. So I'm going to turn it back to Isabel. Yes, and as James was saying, part of research, right? Part of, part of doing research and courses is to learn from the first time we launched it. So when we launched it in the fall, on paper, it looked great, right? But then it's there's a different reality when you start interacting with participants. Um, and what's amazing about this experience from my perspective as a researcher is working with a team that's willing to problem solve. So we saw that we had um, low, late, low rates sorry, of participation. So Linda, James and I, we met and we brainstormed about what are some of um, some other strategies that we can employ to actually help um, increase recruitment. And one of the things that we did was to actually, um, the pre and the post um, became part of course content. So 2.5% for each was assigned. And um, we decided um, as a team that regardless of what they would score on the, on the pre and the post, they would still get their 2.5%. So it takes some of the anxiety with doing a um, grammar test. And also the module completion, instead of doing the 10 module the first, like the first time around, we asked for them to, um, to do a proportion of them. So they could select the modules as long as they met the cutoff, which I think is six, if I remember correctly. If they do six out of the 10 modules, they get a 5% as well um, of their final grade. So that's in total, this research project is 10% of their um, final grade, whether they participate in the research or not, which is also, I think, really important to consider that we don't want to put any students at a disadvantage. And this would not have been possible without um, the collaboration between Compton 16 faculty, Linda, um, and James and I just trying to find solutions to um, increase participation. We also have gift cards. Um, so there's um, 60 gift cards that we draw at the end of the semester for students that participated in the research and indicated that they wanted to be an incentive draw. And I think one of the 
things that we realize is also the importance of recruitment. So even though I went and did recruitment in person, um, we also ask ethics to have, um, we made an amendment or ethical prot protocol to ask for having a video. So now there's a, I visit the classroom, but I also they also have on their Blackboard shell um, a video, a screencast of me explaining the study. And we have a dedicated email address that only um, comes to James and I's inboxes to answer questions. And I think this also helped with supporting students that had questions or might have missed class and were unsure about exactly what it was. So I think um, there's definitely a lot of lessons to be learned when you do course um, based research. But this is, has been like, from my perspective, an amazing um, opportunity because of how people are working together, um, not only to develop content um, in Serigo that we can use, but also to problem solve when we have research um, dilemmas or research problems. Um, and that's it for me. Well, great. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Isabel and uh, Linda and James. and and. I can't reiterate this enough. It, you you need a team. You need collaborators to to make this uh, to make this work. So, really, our final comments here is just sort of next steps. What is Georgian thinking about uh, moving forward? Um, and one of the things I'll say um, before I kind of go through these points is that one of the one of the unique parts of this project is that we picked comms uh, com ten sixteen which uh, as Linda explained is an English course looking at grammatical structure and a course that students struggle with. And it's not a common course that you would see in an adaptive platform. And we really uh, saw that as a unique opportunity. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a more difficult module to build or they were difficult modules to build, um, but we relished in that, uh, in that sort of process. And, and I kudos to that team for really taking on uh, uh, an adaptive platform for a discipline that uh, we often don't see uh, uh, merged together or married together in that way. So moving forward, what does this mean for us? Um, as Linda and James alluded to, we're hoping for greater student participation, not just in the research, but also in using the, the platform itself. Uh, we've opened up the platform to more and more faculty outside of the research uh, parameters just to get uh, more students incentivized to use the product and the platform to get faculty more, uh, it, it, sorry, additional faculty using the platform. So we're opening it up. Uh, we uh, have built, I think, 10, uh, 12 plus modules, Linda mentioned. We're looking at potentially building a few more modules. It all depends on capacity and time of our faculty, but there's a couple of other um, skills uh, in the COM 1016 course that could be uh, leveraged using uh, the Serigo platform. Uh, well, now we're starting to explore other programs. Uh, where else could we use this? And uh, we've talked about going back to more traditional adaptive platform programs, for example, a more of a apprenticeship type of program. So we are having conversations with James and others at the college to see who else would like to try this. Uh, obviously, we want to crunch our data. We want to we want to kind of package our narrative up and, and go around the college and, and convince people and share with people uh, the work that we've done and um, and hoping that uh, more will come on board. But we'll see. We'll see where that lands. Uh, I know there is commitment uh, on the liberal arts side to continue with, with Serigo. I think there is a real appetite for it. So this will be a pilot that will be ongoing. Uh, we're going to revisit, revisit our research uh, parameters. Linda and James already hinted at that. We'll continue to do that, continue to tweak and sharing our success story. I mean, today is our first step uh, in that journey, but sharing with our leadership team, sharing with other faculty. We have a faculty conference coming up in May. Um, and there's a hope that uh, we'll present at our internal conference and, and just get the word out that uh, what an adaptive platform is, what it isn't, and how it could possibly help. And that really kind of leads us to the end of our, our uh, next steps. And uh, Don, I believe we will now open it up uh, to questions. Well, thank you uh, very much. Absolutely. And uh, if any uh, folks have uh, questions, just feel free to uh, put up your hand and uh, we'll be glad to uh, let you open your mic if anyone has questions. Give it a second there. I know uh, Brian shared uh, a study in the links in the chat if anyone's interested in uh, taking a look uh, at that in a little more detail. And I've also shared the Sergo uh, website in the chat as well for any folks who want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, no, I'm, I'm just curious, Mark, you mentioned 
at the beginning, quite, quite a large team of folks that have been involved in this faculty and instructional designers, project managers and stuff. Now, as this project matures, as it becomes, it goes more and more, um, you know, pervasive throughout the institution, assuming it continues. Do you see the, re the team requirement kind of being more of a front end investment and getting easier over time? Is that kind of the plan with, with this rollout? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I should give additional credit to, to other members. We didn't list all the faculty names. And, and if you're interested, uh, we can share those faculty names. We also had a, a great, uh, Andrew Greif was a great instructional designer. So we do it do have other members outside of this group, but to your point, yes. Uh, and Linda, you, if you don't mind, if you want to jump in too, but I think we, we the, the bulk of the work is really building out those modules. Once they're built, once they're in, similar to an LMS, the content runs itself. You can hit refresh and reset uh, and let it run. Obviously, if you want to go in and tweak, modify, if you're looking for something different, uh, absolutely. But it, it is a bit of a, it can be a self-sustained experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I would, I would suggest that you would go in with some sort of maintenance cycle in place, right? On an annual basis, go in to make sure uh, that uh, the modules you have are, are doing what you want them to do uh, using the metrics and dashboards, which we didn't talk about too much today. And that's because we're really sort of in the early stages, but there, there are dashboards and, and opportunities to collect data around how students are moving through um, the platform, where they are struggling, when they struggle, how much time they take at, uh, at each level. Um, that's the kind of data we're still kind of working through. That would inform future practices around, do we need additional modules? But it's also a little bit more than that. It's really not just the platform. And, and one of the reasons why we wanted to take on this challenge was that we wanted to give um, more information, more data back to our faculty. For example, if a faculty member uh, starts to see that 80% of their students start to struggle on comma splices, uh, and I'll be honest, I would struggle throughout this whole COM 1016 <laughs> experience. That's one thing the whole group learned is that we would all uh, struggle except for Linda. Um, but uh, if you start to notice that 80% of your students are struggling at points you know, A, B, and D, um, now it's an opportunity for a faculty member to follow up. Right, maybe additional office hours, maybe uh, additional supplemental activities, maybe retweaking the, the, the modules. Uh, it doesn't have to be just tech, a uh, tech solution. It could be a conversation. So we really see this as an opportunity as um, offering uh, moments of engagement, additional moments of engagement, or more purposeful moments of engagement based on what we're seeing from our students and how they are not or are succeeding through the uh, through the modules. Great. Thank you very much. I, I see we do have a couple of uh, questions in the chat. I think the first one's probably more for actually the first two I'll give to Brian uh, and I'll read them both at once. Uh, one, uh, does the Sergal platform support French, uh, Brian? Uh, and also any, I, I, to expand on that, maybe any other language possibilities uh, with, with the platform. And the other kind of second part to that is uh, you mentioned Blackboard uh, in terms of integrations and can the platform integrate with D2L Brightspace? Uh, yes, we work with other language languages, including French. Uh, yes, we 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 work with Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, and D2L. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Brian. Uh, the next question uh, we got here is, uh, and this I guess more for the Georgian team, probably put you on the spot, Mark. But uh, what alternatives to Sergo were considered in the procurement process? I, and I think I, if I could add, have you expand on that, I know we've chatted about this in the past. How challenging was the procurement process for finding yeah. a platform? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to name other vendors. I think you know there's some discretion here in terms of our RF, uh, RFP process. Um, but if we if we think back to those early days, uh, we really wanted to be disconnected from um, de determined content. So publisher content, it was a real uh, and that is one of the main one of the big obstacles you'll see uh, if you explore adaptive platforms. A lot of them are, are tied to publishers. And and if you want that content that that works really well and that that can be a, a great solution for higher ed institutions. It wasn't the solution that we wanted. We, we really wanted a platform where we can flip to any program at any time and not worried about those constraints. So it really had to be open. Uh, it really had to be uh, free in that sense. We really wanted the ability to create whatever content we wanted 
um, and it, the platform was agnostic in that sense. The other challenge we found is that this is a tough marketplace. Uh, a lot of adaptive platform um, vendors that were here five, six, seven years ago have moved out of the higher ed landscape and they've moved into the private sector for a variety of reasons. So finding a vendor that A, would be a, a good partner uh, that was open and free in terms of how we would use the platform um, was one of the challenges, but that was in the F RFQ. We didn't get um, uh, dozens of uh, applicants, I'll say that, um, but it was, uh, they had to check all the boxes off and, and that's how we landed on this uh, current partnership. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question, I think, is just more technical. Uh, can you uh, you can deliver SCORM, I'm sorry, uh, is SCORM exporting also possible from other LMSs or for other LMSs? And I guess, um, Brian, or, or even for the Georgian team, how easy is it if you already have existing content to easily import or export in or out of the uh, Sergo platform? I, I, I had that question as well. Like, was there a lot of reworking of content, which we know can be a cumbersome process? Uh, kind of, can you shed any light on that? Um, yeah, I'll just say from uh, a development side, the authoring tool in Serigo is extremely easy to use. Um, and that was one of the things that really drew me and the comm faculty team to this platform. Um, it's very easy to use to develop your content, um, you know, with and, and I will say also, Brian is great. Um, Brian is extremely helpful. He answers our questions very quickly and is always willing to meet with us and help us if we're having any challenges. But from a development side, in terms of taking the content and inputting it into the platform, it's extremely easy to use. And Brian, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about the SCORM exporting, but certainly for me, it was that was one of the things that really drew me to this platform. Uh, it's uh, it's been a, a joy uh, working with you, Linda, and everybody on the team. And um, we we tried to make our authoring tools as as easy to master as possible for folks. Um, typically speaking, you should be able to um, have like a forty five minute session max and walk away really knowing about all our activity types and how to use them. Uh, we have smart tools that allow you to. Uh, place text passages as, as study items into the system and get some automatic quiz creation uh, to help speed the process of, uh, of creating content. We, we hope that we'll be able to, uh, with the advent of chat GPT, we'll be able to improve upon those smart tools very soon uh, to lower the threshold that it takes to, to create content even further. And uh, the, the final thing I just want to say for motion is um, we work with the, the, uh, the armed forces and they wanted SCORM simulation. Uh, so we've now literally just today, we've got SCORM simulation uh, integrated into the system. And, and it's the thing that's cool about it is SCORM packages are typically delivered just once. Um, but with this, with this uh, functionality, you can actually have it be adapted. So students are revisiting visiting that SCORM content within the platform. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hard to believe we're already coming to the end of our of our one hour, but lots of uh, great uh, questions. So, so thank you very much. Uh, but that uh, does conclude our uh, webinar for today. I'd like to thank uh, all of you, our presenters, uh, for sharing these experiences. Uh, and thank you very much to you, our audience. I hope you found some useful information to inspire you to start considering these types of uh, platforms uh, in your practice programs, courses. Uh, and certainly I wanna thank uh, my uh, eCampus Ontario communications team. They do so much behind the scenes, setting up the registration and helping facilitate these webinars and get it out to you folks in the sector. And we certainly couldn't do it without them. So thank you very much, comms. Um, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about what we're doing at eCampus and adaptive learning, or if you'd like to connect on projects like what we've seen here today and work you might be doing, I'd love to hear about it. Love to create space for you to share it with the sector. So please feel free to reach out. You can check out our adaptive learning webpage, which uh, uh, Lutfia will post in the chat here if you want to find out a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, our next webinar is actually on March 22nd, and we're going to be talking to Eureka. 
another adaptive learning platform. Uh, they're going to bring bringing some education partners to the table, uh, a couple of Ontario universities, which I won't get into yet, but they're going to be talking about using an adaptive platform in the healthcare uh, program. So that certainly is something that I'm hoping folks will want to register for. You can access the registration for that on our events page. So, uh, and uh, let Phil share the uh, link in the chat. Uh, feel free to explore eCampus Ontario's website for all of our various programs and services. A few items I really want to mention uh, are open library events where you can learn about the use of OER, role play, gamification, bilingual use of OERs, and more. Additionally, our open library team is offering virtual drop-in sessions where you can get synchronous support on any questions you have about open, OER, or any of our open library services and platforms. Uh, the Open Library has its own events page, which Lipfield post in the chat, and you can access uh, registration and recordings there from our previous sessions. Uh, in addition, uh, Ontario Extend is offering live uh, facilitated sessions right now through uh, till April 2023. Uh, this professional development program offers participants the opportunity to earn a micro credential as an empowered educator. These live sessions are designed to help you get started and create connections with other educators across the province. Register for the program and these live sessions by visiting our Ontario Extend webpage at the link now being posted in the chat. And finally, eCampus Ontario will be hosting the Micro Credential Forum on March uh, uh, 1 to 3. Uh, this event it does include an in-person session at the Toronto uh, Globe and Mail Centre, but unfortunately that is now sold out uh, thanks to uh, very popular demand. But not to worry, you can still catch the uh, virtual events on March 2 and 3. So come on out and explore the evolving relationship between micro credentials and the labour market. We'll highlight the impact of micro credentials on industry, showcase recent employer institutional partnerships, and you'll take home tangible solutions from leaders who are tackling some of the sector's latest challenges. So visit the Micro-Credential Forum 2023 webpage that Lutfiel now put in the chat. Um, all of the links uh, from today will, and the video of the recording for today will be sent out to all registrants. So not to worry if you didn't catch all of this. And I just wanna again say thank you very much and wish everybody a fantastic day.